Today is May 1st, 1992. The subject of this video message is the UNCED Earth Summit, the meeting which is to begin on June 1st, 1992 in Rio de Janeiro. The acronym UNCED stands for the United Nations Committee for Environment and Development. It is pronounced unsaid and perhaps indicating the secret agenda of this meeting. This is the logo of the Earth Summit. This is not a dove in their Earth Summit logo. It is a hand, and the hand is holding the world with a slogan in our hands alongside of it. In whose hands? Who is the we in this motto? The hands of the world order. These elitists convened this unsaid meeting in the first place, and for a bad purpose. This video will show strong evidence that the persons running the unsaid Earth Summit are actually setting a net to place the power over the Earth and its peoples into their hands. Brave, bold deeds by the citizenry are needed quickly. Once a government signs their treaties, their citizens are de jure in the hands of the world order. There's that motto again, in our hands. Whose hands? the same world order families that planned World War I and World War II, that tricked the third world countries to borrow funds and rack up enormous debts, the same world order that stole much of the money borrowed by Africans and other nations and hid it in Geneva banks. They are the persons who financed Hitler, manufactured the Holocaust, and managed to blame the terrible deeds on the German people. They can be credited with manipulating famines in Ethiopia and elsewhere and purposely creating war and debt to bring societies into their control. The world order crowd are not a nice group of people. My name is George Hunt. I'm speaking to you from a video studio in Boulder, Colorado. I have attended some of the meetings and caucuses leading to the Unsaid Earth Summit. I am a business consultant and a college teacher in small business management. I own an environment company too and am very familiar with the environment hypocrisy that the world order crowd has taken over the environment movement. I am aware of their plans. Please pardon me as I read my script. I'm not a professional actor and my memory will not serve me with the things that I want to say. The world environment movement will soon be in the hands of the world order if you and others do not respond with action after you view this videotape. Action may constitute showing this to five others. It may constitute showing it to a judge down the street or a city councilman who you know in your town. Pray for guidance, hoping that something good might come of your actions. Somebody is going to set the spark off. I really feel that it is not too late. When I served as an official host at a key environment meeting in Denver, Colorado in 1987, I was surprised to see David Rockefeller, Edmund de Rothschild, Secretary of State Baker, then Secretary of the Treasury, Maurice Strong, Waste Company Chairman and EPA Administrator William Ruckelshaus, UN Secretary General in Geneva, McNeil, and various World Bank and IMF officials there. What were the rich elite and bankers doing at an environment congress? Listen carefully. I will now attempt to show you how their enactments will work against you. Trust and foundation income is the cornerstone of the world order. They command politicians to do their bidding, and presidents, judges, and legislators lick their boots. Their swollen egos and bellies are never satisfied, and their lust for more is insatiable. Now world power and authority is in their grasp. Are we going to give it to them without a confrontation? Or, like they did to the Germans, will they blame the environment holocaust on you and get away with it? What is the World Summit meeting, and who is behind it? The unsaid World Summit, that's UNCED World Summit, 
is a key event in a series of environment meetings which have occurred since 1972. Maurice Strong, a UN official and an employee of the Rockefeller and Rothschild Trusts and Projects, convened the first Congress in Stockholm, Sweden in 1972. Twenty years later, Maurice Strong is the Secretary General and convener of UNSAID. In the 1970s and 1980s, numerous conferences created political action decrees, eventually to lead to the UNSAID Earth Summit. I attended two meetings in Colorado in 1987 and 1991. Friends attended others in Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Des Moines. Here is a paper from the Des Moines meeting where Maury Strong was in charge. Representative Gephardt's telephone number appears on the meeting documents. Here are some phrases from the document of the Secretariat for World Order which were distributed at the Des Moines unsaid meeting. We are the living sponsors of the great Cecil Rhodes will of 1877 in which Rhodes devoted his fortune to the extension of British rule throughout the world and colonization by British subjects of the entire continent of Africa, the Holy Land, the Valley of the Euphrates, the islands of Cyprus and Candia, the whole of South America, the islands of the Pacific not heretofore possessed by Great Britain, the whole of the Malay archipelago, the seaboard of China and Japan, the ultimate recovery of the United States of America as an integral part of the British Empire. We stand with Lord Milner's credo. We too are British race patriots and our patriotism is the speech, the traditions, the tr principles, the aspirations of the British race. Do you fear to take this stand at the very last moment when this purpose can be realized? Do you not see that failure now is to be pulled down by the billions of Lilliputians of lesser race who care little or nothing for the Anglo-Saxon system? Copies of this document are distributed to you with this videotape. At the Fourth World Congress meeting in 1987, some other bad remarks about common people were made. I'm going to play them for you now. For instance, here is David Lang, a Montreal international investment banker, one of their PAC, decreeing that these environment and economic activities of the world order not be shared with the public. He calls us cannon fodder. Listen to this. I suggest, therefore, that this be sold not through a democratic process. That would take too long and devour far too much of the funds to educate the cannon fodder, unfortunately, which populates the earth. We have to take almost an elitist program that we can see beyond our swollen bellies and look to the future in time frames and in results which are not easily understood or which can be, with intellectual honesty, be reduced down to some kind of simplistic definition. Does it make you feel uncomfortable that the arrogant rich are close to complete rule over the United States, Canada, and other countries? Here's more. The decrees leading to the Earth Summit were dictated without debate or opportunity for dissent. The treaties the World Order once signed at UNSAID will supersede national laws. Yet I saw the major decrees at the Fourth World Congress dictated into existence by Edmund de Rothschild. You can hear it too. Listen to him dictate. Rothschild got these major decrees into the United Nations resolutions without debate or challenge. But perhaps this conference might like to think more about the Marshall Plan which had been mooted and put forward very tentatively at the uh, Denver Conference. And perhaps this might be the keynote of what you have heard today and what perhaps you might like in some perhaps amended form to have put forward. At this conference, recognizing the needs to protect our ecological and environmental heritage within the concept of the World Wilderness Congress, World Wildlife Fund and all other bodies involved in the preservation of life on our planet, asked the Prime Minister of Norway, Right Honorable the Gro Harlem Brooklyn, 
as one of the world's leaders of a greatly respected community to be the promoter of this International Conservation Bank. By her Brookland report, which has been widely circulated to world leaders, she could follow up this report with the recommendations to promote a second Marshall Plan, the third World Debt Relief and Finance for a Stable Development. Nobody at that caucus mentioned a second World Marshall Plan or a new currency system to finance a stable development. The World Conservation Bank had not been thoroughly discussed at all. I was denied the opportunity to openly challenge Rothschild's remarks at the caucus by the World Conservation Bank President and Meeting Chairman I. Michael Sweetman. In world politics, the names of first world, second world, third world, and fourth world are used to describe blocks of political entities. The first world is the capitalist countries of Europe and North America. They are industrial and are, therefore, the world's biggest polluters. The second world is the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc countries. Do you remember Rothschild referring to a second world Marshall Plan? He was speaking of the Soviet bloc countries, not a second Marshall Plan. He was speaking of the Soviet bloc countries and that they will be rescued by first world money. Europe was granted huge sums of money by the Marshall Plan in 1949, and the second world will receive billions of North American money in this repeat performance. And guess what banking family will act as the main money changers for the Russian ruble? possibly absconding with billions, the Rothschild Group, of course. Rothschild made these remarks back in 1987, two years before the Berlin Wall was torn down. He was bragging to us that he knew the Soviet regime would collapse. Here are some April 1992 news articles about the progress of Rothschild's Second World Marshall Plan. They come from the New York Times, and the world order is right on time. Here is a April 15, 1992, New York Times headline. $44 billion needed to aid ex-Soviets in 1992, IMF says. It's needed for a shift to the free market. Most of the help would finance imports of food and spare parts for 15 republics. My response to that is, sure. Another article in the International edition of the New York Times, Wednesday, April 29th, 1992, had this to say about Rothschild's Marshall Plan. Although there has been much talk about building a new political order in the post-Cold War world, the events here in the last few days make clear that a new economic order is also rapidly emerging. Washington cannot bankroll a Marshall Plan for the former Soviet republics because the task is so enormous and because the American economy is debt ridden and no longer so dominant. That is why Washington has asked the IMF to run the rescue operations which are expected to cost $44 billion this year. Well, Rothschild really called it, didn't he? Soon after these remarks were made, the Rothschilds reopened the Rothschild Bank in Frankfurt, Germany after 50 years of closure. They are now conveniently available to stabilize the Russian ruble with money from the West. Question, do we really want to send North American money abroad so the Rothschilds can make multi-billion dollar windfalls on the currency trades? Let's talk about the third world now. The third world are those countries who have emerged since World War II. Young and easily fooled, the World Bank under Robert S. McNamara played bad tricks on them, spiriting billions of loan dollars back to Swiss bank accounts through fictitious African addresses. They now owe $1.5 trillion to the world banking system with nothing to show for it except poverty and cruel loan collections. Maurice Strong has suggested an ominous scenario at the UNSAID meeting 
which could break out if his words are to, believed, to be believed. He says in this article in West Magazine that a fight may erupt between the first world polluters and the third world poor. Here is how he describes it. Each year, he explains as background to the telling of his novel's plot, the World Economic Forum convenes in Davos, Switzerland. Over a thousand CEOs, prime ministers, finance ministers, and leading academics gather in February to attend meetings and set economic agendas for the year ahead. With this as a setting, Maurice Strong then says, what if a small group of these world leaders were to conclude that the principal risk to the earth comes from the actions of the rich countries? And if the world is to survive, those rich countries would have to sign an agreement reducing their impact on the environment. Will they do it? He's really talking about the unsaid meeting. And Strong, driving as I take notes, looks at me. Then his eyes go back to Highway 17 on the way from Alamosa, Colorado to his New Age ranch in Crestone, Colorado. He says, the man who founded the United Nations Environment Program and who wrote parts of the Brundtland Report and who in 1992 will try to get the world's leaders meeting in Brazil to sign just such an agreement savors the questions hanging in the air. Will they do it? Will the rich countries agree to reduce their impact on the environment? Will they agree to save the earth? Strong resumes his story. The group's conclusion is no. The rich countries won't do it. They won't change. So, in order to save the planet, the group decides, isn't the only hope for the planet that the industrialized civilizations collapse? Isn't it our responsibility to bring this about? This group of world leaders, he continues, form a secret society to bring about an economic collapse. It's February. They're all at Davos. These aren't terrorists. They're world leaders. They have positioned themselves in the world's commodity and stock markets. They've engineered using their access to stock exchanges and computers and gold supplies a panic. Then they prevent the world stock market from closing. They jam the gears. They hire mercenaries who hold the rest of the world leaders at Davos as hostages. The markets can't close. The rich countries and Strong makes a slight motion with his fingers as if he were flicking a cigarette butt out the window. I sit there spellbound. This is not any storyteller talking. This is Maurice Strong. He knows these world leaders. He is, in fact, co-chairman of the Council of the World Economic Forum. He sits at the fulcrum of power. He is in a position to do it. I probably shouldn't be saying things like this, he says. Highway 17 cuts straight across the desert, heading out of the land of dreams. When the truth is finally told, Maury Strong fears the world will come to this. No secret societies, no hostage takings at Davos, but it will come to the same conclusion. The global economy, sapped by credit and debt loads and environmental disasters, will simply come unstuck. And nothing, not even the inspiration of the Baca, can save humankind from itself. They see the struggles and problems at the Baca as reflections of the problems assaulting the planet. They fear the Baca will be, at best, an oasis in the desert of the future, and at worst, a place where dreams die. Even if Strong is fictionalizing and imagining, why would he even suggest these things? The point remains something important is going to happen at the unsaid Earth Summit. The fourth world. No one really talks about the fourth world, do they? That's because we haven't seen the fourth world come about. The fourth world came up in the title of the Congress I attended. It was called the Fourth World Wilderness Congress. Maurice Strong said it was called the Fourth World because it was the fourth one of these environment congresses that Edmund de Rothschild had created. I learned later that the world order refers to the coming one world government as the Fourth World. World control by the world order 
where there is no more first, second, and third world. Just a boundaryless planet which is called the fourth world wilderness. Yogis and shamans refer to it as the fourth world wilderness, the lostness of the mind. The lostness of the mind refers to the collective consciousness. Persons will be coerced through lies, drugs, fear and pain to surrender their selves, their egos, to the collective consciousness. The fourth world will be a return to a society much like the Caesars or Babylon or the Fourth Reich within the fictionalized societies described in Huxley's Brave New World and Brave New World Revisited and Orwell's classic 1984. We will flourish with only a whimper. The world order wants to create a new society out of the ashes of chaos, a collectivist fourth world complete with a collectivist religion, collectivist finance, and unchecked world national socialism. The world order will offer Gaia, Mother Earth, to the masses as the Big Brother image to worship in the fourth world. Maurice Strong has already set up a 140,000 acre project in Crestone, Colorado to develop this Earth religion system. Projects are funded by the Rockefeller Fund, among other foundations. The Earth Summit will link environment with industry. The Lords of the Unsaid Conference will be the masters of who gets what and when if we don't do something about it quickly. Who leads the environment movement? The convener of the summit, Maurice Strong, identifies Baron Edmund de Rothschild as the creator of the environment movement. Here are his own words describing Rothschild as the positive synthesis of environment on the one hand and growth and development on the other. Listen carefully as Maury Strong introduces Baron de Rothschild. So there is no better person. He epitomizes in his own life that positive synthesis between environment, conservation on the one hand, and economics on the other. And I'm just delighted to have this opportunity of uh, introducing to you Edmund de Rothschild. Maurice, thank you very much indeed for all that you've said, uh, and uh, I would ask the audience to take with a slight grain of salt all that he has said about me. Rothschild is the positive synthesis of environment on the one hand, that's the thesis, and growth and development on the other, that's the antithesis. He very clearly admits that the Rothschild combination, including the Rockefellers and most world capitalists, aim to control the environment and development movement as the synthesis. Power will converge into their hands through the Rio Conference. The, synth the synthesis, the head of the power, merges into the House of Rothschild. Another speaker at the Fourth World Conference was David Rockefeller, world energy capitalist and banker. He was named Mr. Growth and Development at the meeting. His counterpart, William Ruckelshaus, organizer of the EPA and creator of its laws under Presidents Ford and Reagan, was dubbed Mr. Environment. Here is a picture of the chuckling antagonist at the meeting. Mr. Environment Ruckelshaus is the CEO and chairman of the board for BFI, Browning Ferris Industries, one of the largest private environment companies in the world. The hypocrisy is that Ruckelshaus, as EPA chief, made the very laws by which his waste company, BFI, is becoming rich. Hypocrisy number two is that Ruckelshaus and Maurice Strong were key investors in American water development, a company which tried to circumvent Colorado water laws and gain control of one of the largest underground reservoirs of water in the world. Here's an excerpt from a video interview where I explain what they did. And I did a survey of the people down in the San Luis Valley, and I sent letters out to these farmers last December, and I said, what will happen if Morris Strong and William Ruckel's house and others pull water, 200,000 acre feet of water out of the San Luis Valley? Without one hesitation, it was unanimous that their, their land will turn into a wasteland. 
that will turn into a desert. So here we have people at an Environment Congress that are then waltzing 200 miles south of Estes Park down in the San Luis Valley of Colorado that want to suck the, the aquifers dry and turn it into a desert. The, the hypocrisy is so deep. They failed in their attempt because the people learned what they were doing and defeated them. Here is a newspaper article that shows their defeat. I hope we can do it again around the unsaid meeting. Let's hear a little more from Maurice Strong and Edmund de Rothschild and lock in on what kind of people are running the unsaid summit meeting. Here's the part where Rothschild says that projects launched to save the environment will be inoperative. He says it quickly, but he says inoperative. That is, they will not work. And listen to Rothschild snidely suggest that we build dry ice machines and ship up the dry ice to the North and South Poles to keep them from melting. Perhaps it could be possible to utilize CO2, carbon dioxide, one of its main causes, to manufacture dry ice to maintain the polar caps and the actual temperature of the ice there and maintain their present temperature. Innovative and modern technology, world waste material collected and perhaps burnt in volcanic areas or buried so deep in the earth in the wilderness desert areas of the mid-Sahara where nobody goes or in the empty quarter in Arabia or the Gobi Desert. But all these ideas and visions, some far-fetched and above all, the continuation of this Congress needs money. I will play the full speech after this video and you will hear him say that the world order has these problems. It's indigenous people and it's wildlife. People and wild animals are problems? What kind of madness are these world order Caesars afflicted with? I hope I have given you enough information to expose the designs of the world order crowd. They hope to run the lives of people for generations to come. They are the same crowd who created a Hitler, arranged the assassination of Lincoln and Kennedy, and have indicated elsewhere that they want to drastically reduce the population of the world to make environment and development more sustainable. Please quickly carry the truth to others. This video has photocopy exhibits accompanying it too, and you can make unaltered copies of this videotape as much as you please. Large quantities can be ordered at $8 a piece, including photocopied materials, plus postage, until July 4, 1992. Send your orders and checks to this address. If you want to talk, I will call you collect. So send me your phone number. The light of freedom is going out throughout the world. You know who the culprits are now. It may not be too late to educate key people who can stop them. And you, watching this videotape, are one of the sparks that may ignite the countryside into flames of indignation against these people. Perhaps society still has some leaders that won't let us down. Goodbye and God bless you. So let's get the proceedings running now and we will uh, see how we go. Thank you. Mr. Morris Strong, whom most of you already know. Thank you very much, and you've already heard perhaps too much from me, so I think this is, we're reaching the point at which we want to involve you, all of you, uh, in uh, uh, the next step of this conference, which is really to come to grips with some of the principal action-oriented issues, and one of the most important initiatives that is uh, open here for your consideration is of that of the uh, uh, conservation banking program. Uh, as we mentioned this morning, we have as our chairman, fortunately, the person who really is the source of this very uh, significant uh, concept. Uh, he uh, he uh, uh, was is one of the trustees of the International Wilderness Foundation, which sponsored this meeting. He, has, he was at the first of these congresses. So his conversion to the 
relationship between conservation and economic development uh, has been a, a, a pioneering one. His work on many dams. He's, you know, I used to be in the hydroelectric power part of the energy business myself. Uh, and uh, the many of the energy developments that we've seen have come from his early anticipation of our energy needs and his early work in supporting pioneering initiatives to deal with these needs. So there is no better person. He epitomizes in his own life that positive synthesis between environment, conservation on the one hand, and economics on the other. And I'm just delighted to have this opportunity of uh, introducing to you Edmund de Rothschild. Morris, thank you very much indeed for all that you've said. Uh, and uh, I would ask the audience to take with a slight grain of salt all that he has said about me. And I want to start there a little bit of my talk to you on a somewhat different vein. You see, in order to further the ideals of the world wilderness concept and to prevent the concept and this concept just to remain an ideal, it is of paramount importance to find ways and means of finding and promoting its rationale. There are these ways and means of putting this concept into effect and overcoming or minimizing some of the problems set out by the speakers in this Congress, such as pollution, prevention of acid rain, waste disposal. There are alternative methods and a harmless alternative methods for energy and they're available. Alternative uses of water resources not involving vast inundations of land or displacing humans and its indigent wildlife, harnessing wave energy, solar energy, wind power, just to mention a few. To overcome the chilling, doom-laden prognostications of Dr. Irving Mincer's greenhouse effect, perhaps it could be possible to utilize CO2, carbon dioxide, one of its main causes, to manufacture dry ice to maintain the polar caps and the actual temperature of the ice there and maintain their present temperature. Innovative and modern technology, world waste material collected and perhaps burnt in volcanic areas or buried so deep in the earth in the wilderness desert areas of the mid-Sahara where nobody goes or in the empty quarter in Arabia or the Gobi Desert but all these ideas and visions, some far-fetched, and above all, the continuation of this Congress needs money. A start has been made by the thoughts and care of one man. Michael Sweetman, his ideas have had lip service paid to them by some of our speakers here during the Ken Denver Conference. The meetings now of the new concept of an international conservative banking, conservation banking program involves all sectors of the human community, governmental and intergovernmental agencies, the public and private agencies, large charitable foundations, as well as ordinary individuals worldwide. Michael Sweetman has written the foreword to this concept. Its final form will no doubt be altered, watered down, or widened. But this convention must put forward this charter. And with the collective wisdom available here today, the charter can be enhanced, embracing those who have given their thoughts in the Denver Public Forum. By thinking forward as to how to reach out to the public at large, to every corporate entity throughout the world, to put aside, hopefully tax-free, a part of their profits to fund our ecological and environmental protection. Ladies and gentlemen, every country has its own problems, its indigenous peoples and its wildlife. 
This international conservation bank must know no frontiers, no boundaries. Its funds must be used constructively and not, and not to be challenged into greedy hands or weapons of destruction. I hesitate to link this bank with world wilderness, but I would like to link it with our survival as a human race. This, our generation, must not be cursed by our descendants, if we have any, as to the greatest destructors and squanderers of the world's resources. That great philosopher and cleric, Payard de Chardin, wrote, and I quote, Man can harness the winds, the waves, and the tides, but when he can harness the energy of love, then for the second time in the history of the world, man will have discovered fire. Michael Sweetman. Michael Sweetman, your love for the world wilderness concept has given you the necessary fire in your belly to produce the germ of the future needs of this concept. And I have great pleasure in asking you to put it forward. <laughs>